Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Scott Harris, University of Mary Washington Museums, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the museum's program for Black History Month 2019. Uh, we'll be getting into the description of that in just a moment, but I uh, want to thank the sponsors that help make all of the museum's public programs possible throughout the year. These include the Stuart Jones Charitable Trust, the Paul and Jane Jones Trust, Fredericksburg Savings Charitable Foundation, and the Friends of the James Monroe Museum. Now, if any of you in the audience happen to not be members of the Friends of the Museum, we can fix that very easily. Uh, you can go to the museum's website, jamesmonroemuseum.org. You can find out information about the various giving levels, opportunities there, sign up. Uh, the website also contains information on the museum's upcoming programs and lots of other resources, but we also have at the back of the room tonight uh, some of the program schedules for uh, the museum's activities for this year. So I encourage you to take one of those. We're also happy to have some information from the university's James Farmer Multicultural Center uh, on hand as well. So we'd encourage you to do that. And we do have a refreshment table this evening, so I uh, hope you'll take advantage of that uh, to conclusion. James Monroe's public career, as well as his family's personal standard of living, were founded upon slavery. Although his correspondence contains repeated instances of affectionate, if paternalistic, commentary about their welfare, throughout his life, Monroe utilized some 250 enslaved African Americans to work his various farms, sustain his household, and raise his children. He bought and rented enslaved people and regularly sold them. And it is one of those sales that is the subject of tonight's presentation. Miranda Burnett is an independent researcher and reference librarian in Charlottesville, Virginia. She is a part-time guide at James Monroe's Highland, our sister institution in Albemarle County. She was previously a guide at James Madison's Montpelier. Ms. Burnett holds a master's degree in French from the University of South Carolina and a master's in library and information science from Florida State University. Her article, Florida Bound, The Intersection of the Domestic and International Slave Trades at Casabianca Plantation, which details her ongoing research endeavor, is currently under review by a scholarly journal. Martin Violet is an independent researcher and, like Miranda, a part-time guide at Highland. He also spent eight years as a guide at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Mr. Violet holds a master's degree in Russian literature from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and worked in Anglophone and Francophone literature of the Caribbean at Cornell and the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. Burnett and Violet partnered in 2017 to answer the question, what happened to the enslaved families that James Monroe sold to Florida in 1828? Since beginning their work, they have shared their findings on their website which is takethemininfamilies.com, and given a presentation to descendants of these families in Monticello, Florida. I believe you've also done a program at Highland, have you not? In oh, or in, in the Charlottesville area. Well, it is our, my pleasure to welcome Miranda Burnett and Martin Violet to our stage tonight. all of you, welcome to Florida Bound, James Monroe's Slaves. Um, Florida Bound, two words that together can have multiple meanings. Bound meaning a destination, and bound meaning fettered. And the enslaved families that Monroe sold uh, to Florida, these two words aptly describes them. This story involves two presidents, two congressmen, the wealthiest man in America, the author of the Star Spangled Banner, the Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court, an antebellum plantation, and a pirate ship. Sounds like a Hollywood musical. It's not. It's yet another story of lost and stolen history of African Americans. And it begins in 1828. James Monroe sold his plantation in Albemarle County, Virginia in 1826, moved all his possessions 
to a plantation he was establishing in Northern Virginia called Oak Hill in Loudoun County. That is, all his, all his holdings except for a number of supernumerary and slave people that he no longer needed, but he did need money. And in 1828, he completed a sale of those people who remained in Albemarle County to a man building a plantation in Florida. Now what this means for modern highlands is that we don't have the wealth of information that has been collected by researchers, particularly at Monticello for 25 years now, and also at Montpelier for a lesser period of time, but still a considerable amount of, of effort's gone into it. We don't have the oral history's family stories that would inform a presentation of, of slavery at Highland. Uh, that's because there were no local descendants to gather these stories from. Everyone was sold to Florida. So I started work there in 2014. In 2015, I thought, well, Florida's still there, so why don't we take a look and see if we can trace the descendants of those enslaved people who were sold to Florida determine the origins of others. They weren't the only people at that plantation, so as the project grew, it grew to encompass the lives of other people at the plantation. To identify these individuals, trace their family names and family lines, and most importantly, and this was a condition of Miranda's when she started working with me, make this information available to those whom it concerned directly living descendants, if we could ever find them, of those folks in Florida or elsewhere. And we did that, as you'll see, by publishing a website. So who did he sell them to? That's what we started with. Um, and I started with pretty much the same information that other researchers had already began using. This work, uh, especially in Northern Virginia, had been started in uh, 2008 by two researchers um, Wynne Saffer and Lori Kimball putting together a database of names with the idea of ultimately discovering living descendants and collecting, collecting their stories. Um, people at Highland had been working on it too. There were two uh, interns, um, Murray and Bell, who had done historical research and compilation of names of enslaved people at, at Highland. Um, we also had uh, locals, uh, Sam Tower and Lenora McQueen, who had done research uh, and gathered a little bit of preliminary information on this plantation in Florida. And I also want to mention two, two people on the Highland staff. One is, is Nancy Stetz, the, the uh, Director of Education at Highland, who compiled uh, as much information as she could that was really the core of our training on slavery at Highland when I began there, very useful information. And the Executive Director, Sarah Von Harper, um, without whose enthusiastic support, and sometimes, oh, I hope they're not going where I think they're going, um, really uh, enabled us to do much of this research. So a lot of people are involved in this besides just the two of us. Um, the things that we started with were, he sold them to a man named Joseph M. White. It was a $5,000 package deal, and White was establishing a cotton or cane or both plantation somewhere in Florida. Those were the bare facts we started with. Now, who was Joseph M. White? Um, I thought it would be pretty difficult to find a Joe White needle in a haystack kind of exercise. It was actually really easy. Joseph M. White was a territorial representative of the territory of Florida in Monroe's administration. Um, he came from Kentucky, but his mother's family came from Albemarle County, Virginia. He lived in Albemarle County for a couple of years and practiced law there involving some dealings with uh, James Monroe and his brother Andrew. So Joseph M. White was an historical character who was pretty easy to locate. He was also a fairly important figure in the development of Florida infra infrastructure in West Florida and Central Florida in his day. His story, interestingly, has been partly eclipsed by the story of his wife, who was an internationally known debutante and got a whole, uh, not debutante, but socialite, and got a lot of attention during her lifetime. Um, so White, had the wherewithal to begin establishing a plantation, and he also had a partner. Uh, this is Richard Henry Wilde, not related to the Wilde of the other presentation that's going on tonight. <laughs> <laughs> One biographer thought so, but it turns out not to be so. Richard Henry Wilde was also a congressman uh, from Georgia, and an interesting character. He was a poet, 
He was an anthologized poet in American poetry. He was a literary critic of sorts. He wrote on Turkina Tassa. Um, and he was active in the establishment of the plantation, but soon basically took the money and ran. Um, went to Europe, lived there for a while before he came back home to America. Now, these two formed a, cas a plantation that was called Casa Bianca. And just like the information about White, it was pretty easy to find information about Casa Bianca. Florida has done a fairly incredible job of digitizing their archives and making them available online. I found about two dozen photographs of the plantation, not very hard to find. But the most important thing I found were plantation papers. And these papers included a, an inventory of Casa Bianca Plantation, which, by the way, was built a little to the east of the city of Tallahassee in Jefferson County, right outside a little village called Monticello. Can't make some of this stuff up. Well, the papers of the plantation included an inventory that White's widow had done in 1855 and 56, right before the Civil War. She wanted to sell out. But that inventory was interesting because it included the names of 121 enslaved people, their ages, and family groups. Very important. Well, we have nothing like that at Highland, but we do have databases, as I mentioned earlier. And so one of the first things I did was try to match names between Highland and Casa Bianca Plantation, which, which turned out to be a profitable enterprise. Now, Highland was not the only source of slaves for Casa Bianca, and Miranda's going to tell you about the work she's done with other sources. Yes, you are now usurping my spot. <laughs> I, thank you for kicking me and getting me to move over. <laughs> Um, so when we began looking through plantation records and so forth, one of the first things that we tend to do is always go for census records and looked at the 1830 census for Joseph White and it said he had 16 enslaved individuals. Now in my mind I'm thinking, okay, he has 16. Two years before James Monroe is selling a group for 5,000, numbers are not quite adding up. There has to be other sources um, for Casa Bianca, for the enslaved individuals there. And sure enough, when you start looking for other records for Joseph White, I came across a shipping manifest. And this is from a year before Monroe is selling those families. Um, White is acquiring 10 enslaved individuals from New Orleans. Most of these are women with their children. Um, the youngest child is one year old. Then, Remember, White also had his partner, Richard Henry, uh, yeah, White had his partner, Richard Henry Wiles. Um, I come across the antelope case being associated with both Wild and with White. Um, I'll, I'm going to give a very brief synopsis, as brief as I can, of the antelope case. Um, but if you would like to um, further resources, the first one is the book The Antelope, published by John Noonan, published in the 70s. Um, published in the 70s, it's a very um, legally dense book. Um, one that may be more accessible, though, is published in 2015, and that's Dark Places of the Earth by Jonathan Bryant. Um, a very easy read. So the Antelope, it is a Spanish uh, slave ship out of Cuba. It's owned by a Spanish merchant company. Um, it's already made numerous voyages between Cuba and Africa. One of its most recent voyages in 1819, they came back with about 220 slaves aboard. So in August of 1819, the Antelope leaves Cuba to go to Africa. A few months after that, um, there is a privateer ship in Baltimore. It is the Columbia. And they leave on their voyage to the east. But then halfway through, they decide they're turning pirate. They change their flag, um, change their name. They become the Araganta. Oops, is that one coming up? There we go. And as it's heading towards Africa, it starts raiding ships all along the way. When it reached the Cape Verde Islands, it fires on a Portuguese fort. Around Sierra Leone, it's briefly detained um, by the British and then let go. Eventually, it makes its way to Gabenda, where the antelope from Cuba is. 
Now the antelope by this time, shall we say, it is fully loaded. It is ready to go back to Cuba. The Aragon to raids the antelope and both ships then head toward the coast of Africa. Or excuse me, thank you, the coast of South America towards Brazil. Um, off the coast of Brazil, the, um, the Araganta is shipwrecked, and the Antelope takes on those survivors. So the Antelope, now just a single ship, heads north. Uh, they're going to attempt to sell their human cargo. They're unsuccessful, though. So they continue heading north, and they head up toward Florida. Of course, Florida at this time, very well known for slave smuggling. There, it's intercepted by the US revenue cutter Dallas and taken to Savannah. When it's taken to Savannah, on board are 280 captives. 106 of those captives were children, but 41% between the ages of five and 10 years old. The average age of those captives was 14 years old. For seven years, it goes through a court case, going all the way up to the Supreme Court, in which we're deciding, are they free? Are they slaves? Who do they belong to? A Portuguese claimant had come along. They weren't able to write, provide documentation that um, those Africans uh, belonged to them. Of course, a Spanish claimant comes along, a Cuban merchant, and they are able to provide that documentation. During the this, this seven years of court cases, the captives are forced to work on local plantations around Savannah, also forced to work for public works pro uh, projects. Finally, 1827, the case is decided. 37 of the cap, or excuse me, 39 of the captives belong to the Spanish claimant. The rest are sent back to, or, or excuse me, sent to the colony of Liberia. This is where our friend Richard Henry Wilde comes into the picture because he joined the Antelope case in 1825. And so in 1827, when he and White are looking to create the Casa Bianca plantation, he sees for himself a business opportunity. And what does he do? He purchases the Spanish claim. Now by this time, two of the captives have died, so he takes possession of 37 of them. He sells a few of them. And then the rest, about 30 in number, are taken to Casabianca, right outside of Monticello. And you can see on the graphic uh, the possible route that they may have taken from Savannah to Florida. So Casabianca Plantation is not just simply where the enslaved families that James Monroe sold. It's not just where they went to. This is where really the, the domestic slave trade and the international slave trade combines right at that one plantation in Jefferson County, Florida. It was an interesting court case. It lasted for quite a while. Um, John Quincy Adams, uh, not officially involved in the case, uh, tried to help the Portuguese, for un for unsuccessfully tried to help the Portuguese make their claim. Uh, later on, had real second thoughts about that when he was involved, of course, with the Amistad um, case, which you know about. The court case was decided uh, after lengthy arguments between Francis Scott Key, the author, of course, of The Star-Spangled Banner, and Stephen Berrien, who was uh, going to be a future attorney general of the US. The decision was made by a court that was composed primarily of slaveholders. And it's no surprise, then, that the decision was that enslaved people were property. And property law trumped natural law, pure and simple. That reaches its really sort of epitome in a way. In 1853 in Richmond, Wilde has gone back to uh, Europe and then back to America. Whoops, I'm going backwards here too. Here we go, Richmond. Gotcha. This is an overflight of Richmond in 1853 showing the extent of the city. The buildings that you'll see in just a second highlighted in red are the 44 auction houses that existed at that time in the city of Richmond only for the purpose of selling enslaved people to states further south that were more successful in their agricultural operations. Indigo, rice, cane, but primarily cotton, which was booming. Uh, Richmond could hardly keep up with the demand. And of course, Richmond's on the James River, and the use of those rivers is where that phrase, sold down the river, comes from. 
And 25 years before, in 1828, that, of course, is exactly what James Monroe had done with the people from Highland. He had sold them down the river to a man establishing a plantation in Florida. Now, the correspondence that we have about this sale begins in 1823. He wrote to his friend, Fulwar Skipwith, about selling slaves south or himself establishing a cotton plantation in Florida. Later on, 24 years later, he's writing to Madison about the pending sale of slaves, but that's going to take a while. He's um, writing to Charles Fenton Mercer, like Monroe, one of the founders of the Abolitionist Society in Virginia, interestingly enough, about whether or not he, wa he wants to know how to make the sale happen. Is he going to need an agent to take them to Florida for him? He's not sure. And then he writes to his son-in-law a little bit later in 1828 that the sale's not finalized. But finally, he writes to his son-in-law, who is um, Samuel Gouverneur, that it's beginning. He's had an agent sell two slaves in Albemarle County. And there may be a sale to this Joseph White of Florida. Then to Madison, the sale to White was finalized for $5,000. It was a package deal, interestingly enough, financed by John Jacob Astor. Astor had volunteered a loan to Monroe during the War of 1812, which Monroe took. And to pay it off, Monroe transferred these enslaved people to Joseph M. White, which basically eliminated his debt to, to Astor. Sort of an interesting three-part play. You wonder if Astor just wanted a play in the cotton market without personally getting too involved in it. But in any case, that's when Monroe's enslaved people were sold to Florida. Now, the interesting thing about these letters, in every single one of them, he makes comments about how he hopes they will be kept in families. He emphasizes the family aspect of the group he is selling to White. And that, that is present in every single letter here. Um, you mentioned it before. The, the problem, of course, arises is, is how sincere is that, is that sentiment and how does it affect what he thinks and does. In 1829, it's not too long before he dies, in 1829 he wrote to his friend General John Mason, who's, who's George Mason's son, and posed four, five, excuse me, five questions about slavery. And these are all about the practical solutions to the problem. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the, at the third, would the funds of the state be equal to dealing with it? He was pretty convinced by this time that if slavery weren't abolished, it would be the end of the US. But he was also pretty convinced that he had no idea whether or not it could really be done. And these not only reflect that sentiment, but you can see the pragmatic, pragmatic James Monroe in that question about funding. Now, Florida at that time, it's worth taking a look at that. What was, what was Florida like? Well, it was probably the hellhole of eastern North America. Um, the wars between Native Americans, escaped enslaved people, and white settlers didn't end until 1842, 14 years after the sale. It, it, was a, it, was, it was a violent and, and vicious climate. And of course, by this time, word had gotten back north about what conditions not only in Florida, but Georgia, Alabama, other places down south were like. So you can imagine the word that went around when, of course, there was gossip about the pending sale. Interestingly enough, there were two at Highland who missed it. George and Phoebe ran off, 1826. That's probably when they're really hearing about what's going on. And the only reason we have this ad of done for James Monroe about these two slaves who had run is because it appeared in the paper that announced Thomas Jefferson's death. So that paper was saved. I mean, that you can imagine how many things like that have actually been lost. Well, so here we have this information, what to do with it. Um, I had started working on this project in 2015. And then in 2016, our, the way we thought about our history at Highland changed dramatically. In 2015, they made some archaeological discoveries that indicated uh, we found James Monroe's house. The proof came in 2016 when they found the wing of the house that was attached to it. Okay, that's a, a done deal, basically. And what happened then was that 
a man contacted our director. This man was George Monroe Jr. And he said, I'm really interested in the history of your uh, finding the house because my ancestors were enslaved at Highland by James Monroe. Their names were Ned and Peggy. The thing was, he wasn't calling from Florida. He was calling from Richmond, Virginia. So Sarah's first question to him was, is there anybody else? <laughs> and George Jr.'s reply was, oh, we're, we're still here. I don't think that's something any of us will ever forget. Well, he continued to say, yeah, my family owned farms right down the road from you. This is 2016, and we're learning about local descendants. We just found his house a year before. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Well, Sarah and George kept working together throughout 2016. I kept plugging away at Florida. And then March 2017, we had a staff meeting, and Sarah, our director, asked for volunteers to do historical research. Miranda raised her hand and said, I want to help Martin do his work on Florida. And I was delighted because she's a pro. She's a reference librarian, and I just sort of futz around at this. But we started working together, and I showed her what I'd done on Florida. But I also said, you know, one of the things that bothers me about Highland's history is we have absolutely no trace of slavery here. We have no site at Highland associated with slavery. And that's a, that's a big lack, just like the oral histories were a big lack. But there is one addition, one addition of the quadrangle that Highland's in that shows a cemetery in the woods a mile south of the house. That's a candidate. Out in the woods and a mile south, those fit. So what, is, what does she say? I'm, and I've gotten used to hearing this, get in the car. <laughs> Let's go find it. Let's bushwhack find it. Well, we had to do a little preparation. We didn't know what we were looking for. And in doing that preparation, we found this book by Lynn Rainville. She's a professor down at Sweetbriar. You can see the title, Hidden History, African-American Cemeteries in Central Virginia. Could it possibly be more apt, more useful for us? Well, not really. The thing that really got us excited, though, was the book detailed the history of a lot of small African-American churches that sprang up right after the Civil War and emancipation. This happened all over the South. And in particular, one church caught our attention. Half a dozen miles from the Highland House is the Middle Oak Baptist Church. Now, the Middle Oak Baptist Church was established in 1871. It's an African-American Baptist church. Um, this is it. It's, real, it's li literally six miles as the crow flies from Highland. Um, the thing that got our attention, though, was Rainville's note that its cemetery is known by the locals as the Monroe Family Cemetery. You can imagine what Miranda said when she learned that, get in the car. So off we went, this is May of 17, went over there, found some recent headstones with the Monroe name on them, and said, sure enough, this looks like a place we have to study. I called him up after that and said, I'm really interested in the history of your church and its connection to Highland. Oh, we'll have somebody get back to you. We, know, we have some people here who really know church history. So I waited a couple of weeks, and then I just got in the car one Sunday after work at Highland, drove over there. It's a 10-minute drive. They're all getting out of church, all 14 of them. They're all my age. <laughs> and there were two ladies walking out the front door of the church. I went up to them and said, I'm the fellow who called you about your church history. And one of them said, well, we figured that. <laughs> then the other one said, that's Ada, my friend now. She's the, she's the one that said that to me. The other one said, you've come to the right place. We're all Monroes. Can you imagine what that sounded like to me? And then the first one, Ada, said, come on in and have lunch with us and tell everybody what you're doing. So I did. We spent about an hour and a half or so just getting acquainted. And one of the things they said was, we have no histories. We're not old enough. Well, Grace, she is. <laughs> That's the first person who piped up. And then somebody piped up and said, well, you know, so-and-so, he had this and related a story. So sure enough, they do have a lot of information. As a matter of fact, her nephew, George Jr., is the one who supplied the information that his ancestors had been slaves at Highland. And this congregation goes back way before that church was established in 1873 and involves one of the Monroes. You're probably familiar with these, a Negro in Virginia. It's a collection of WPA interviews from the 30s, uh, anthologized and expanded in Weevils in the Wheat. Well, this has one account of an enslaved person at Highland, a young, young boy who notes that he, one morning he saw his father and his older brother coming down from the mountain after a prayer meeting. They'd been chased by patty rollers, patrollers, 
and had tricked the patrollers, almost an Anansi story, tricked the patrollers and, and got them dumped in the Hardware River. Um, that's during Monroe's time because that specific note was made by the fellow who related the story. So that really is the beginning of the congregation that ends up at the Middle Oak Baptist Church. And here is Ned and Peggy. These are the ancestors of George Jr. And the family tree, the family is put together. And believe me, this tree extends to that wall and that wall at this scale. It's over 200 names. They know a lot of their history, an awful lot, as we've come to realize. This is the man who related the story to the WPA interviewer. And this is his father that he saw coming down from the mountain with his older brother. Do I really need to make any comments about their character? I don't think so. From looking at these portraits, you, you can tell, I think, what, what kind of folks they were pretty easily. Well, now we go to Miranda and the families themselves. She always has to punch me like that when I just, just want to keep talking for a while. <laughs> so our interactions with the local Albemarle descendants, of course, had us um, asking our own questions. You know, can we find a descendant community in Florida? Um, what about the families that Monroe sold? What were their names even? Um, there are no records of their names, not even a record of how many were sold. So can we, can we narrow that down? Um, what happened to them after their arrival in Florida? And of course, did they create a post-emancipation community as well? Um, so one of the first places that we started uh, in comparing Monroe documents with uh, the Florida Casa Bianca plantation documents is a deed. And this is one for Monroe. And he is mortgaging a group of slaves in 1826. And you'll read in here, he's mortgaging Toby and Betsy, his wife, and their seven children and Dudley and Eve, their two children. So this, when we compare the names to the Casa Bianca plantation, one couple should definitely be jumping out, Toby and Betsy. And then of course we find an Eve uh, there listed with her children. And this is from 1855. Um, now this list is done in family groups which really makes it a gold mine because you can take this list and compare it to then, for example, the 1870 census, the 1880 census, and start, uh, com um, start compiling the family trees. Now, if you look at this, you may wonder, wait a second, we see Toby and Betsy, that one makes sense, but there's only Eve. What happened to Dudley? Well, if you look back further, Casa Bianca records. This is an 1844 deed, and who do we find up there? We find Dudley and Eve. Um, so we know that it was Toby and Betsy and their children, even Dudley and their children that were sold to Casa Bianca. Um, another family group that we did not include in tonight's presentation, just because first if we did, we would be here all night long. Um, we're only gonna focus on two families this evening. Um, but also, it's the Harris family. And looking through the 1870 and 1880 records, they get really complicated. Um, so we're still in the process of, of really figuring out the Harris family. Uh, but Jim Harris and his wife Calypso and their children, who we find in an 1823 Oak Hill inventory, they were also sold by Monroe. Um, when we found out that there was the Middle Oak Baptist Church in Albemarle County. Of course, then we started looking on Google Maps. Is there something similar in Florida? And we come across the Casa Bianca Missionary Baptist Church. Just so happens, it is right across the road from where the main Casa Bianca plantation house was. And it's also on former Casa Bianca land. We came across um, a works progress Works Progress Administration document uh, detailing just a very short history of the church. And one name on it really stuck out to us. If you notice on there, it says the first settled pastor is Reverend D.S. Straws. And D.S. Straws is David Straws. And he married Hannah McGuire, who was the daughter of Dudley and Eve. So we go through Dudley and Eve's family. So these are the McGuire's. Um, I do want to note 
we don't know if this was the surname that they used while enslaved. It was not recorded. Um, this is what we find from later documents, particularly the 1870 and 1880 census. So we do call them the McGuire's, but with that little footnote, not sure if they um, use that last name while enslaved. So Dudley and Eve, um, Dudley, unfortunately, we don't find him past the 1844 deed. Um, Eve, though, we do find in the 1870 census. So she does live to see emancipation. She is living with her youngest son, Richard, um, in, um, in 1870. And it says at that time she is 70 years old, so born around 1800. Now, I already mentioned David Strauss. He was the very first pastor of that Casa Bianca church. And of course, he married Dudley and Eve's daughter, Hannah McGuire. And this is their family from one of the uh, Casa Bianca plantation documents. Now, of course, David McGuire, as a pastor of a church, one of his big functions, he's performing marriages. And this is a copy of one of the marriage certificates that he signed, and that is his signature uh, from the 1890s. Um, I've looked through all of the marriage record books for Jefferson County, and even in the 1890s up to about 1900, you will still find some that in the middle of the name have the X, his mark. You know, if you'll notice, David Strauss is not signing his mark. He is signing uh, his name. Of course, the, the occupation of uh, being a pastor or a reverend, it tends to run in the family. Of course, his son, David Strauss, is also a reverend, and their son, Samuel, is as well. And then, of course, we can find the family in the 1870 census. Uh, as I mentioned, being a reverend is a family trait. Samuel's son, Willie. <laughs> That's his also occupation. He is a pastor, and this is him we found in the 1940 census. And of course, his tombstone. So Willie Strauss, he is the great-grandson of Eve and Dudley, who were sold by Monroe in 1828. Now their oldest son is William McGuire. And we know that William was definitely one of those children. If you remember the deed said Dudley and Eve and their two children, William McGuire was one of those, um, one of those children. He would have been uh, approximately three years old when Monroe sold him to Florida. He was one of the founding trustees of that Casa Bianca church. So here it is, an enslaved man had been owned as a child by James Monroe after emancipation is a trustee of their own house of worship. Um, in 1884, he purchases an acre of land for $25. And we find him in the 1885 Florida census um, for that year. Unfortunately, this is the last record, uh, the last public record in which we find William McGuire. Um, we, in 1900, find his widow. His uh, widow's name was Bella. But what is most significant about this census record, if you look the very far right, there's an O and an F. She owns their home mortgage-free. Yeah. Um, so we just kind of highlighted a few of the members of the McGuire family. This is the entire, uh, so far I should say, the, the entire McGuire tree we've been able to compile. Um, still more names going into the database for the McGuires. Of course, the next family, the Sanders, and this is Toby and Betsy. They are the Sanders. And so just a reminder, there are seven children. Um, so far, we've been able to identify three of their seven children. Uh, there's James, there's another son named Garrett, and then a daughter, Peachy. And those, so far, are the three um, of the seven that we have been able to identify with certainty. Uh, we see them here in the Casa Bianca census, uh, census the Casa Bianca plantation records. Um, and then their oldest son, 
James or Jim. We also see him with his wife, Lucy, and uh, their daughter, Katie and Garrett. James, as I mentioned, was one of the children um, that was sold by Monroe, and he would have been at that time around eight years old when he went to Florida. Um, now, after emancipation, the family moves to Taylor County, and that's just going from one county to the next. They're, they're right adjacent to each other there in Florida. And here we find James with his wife, Lucy, and Katie and Garrett there. Um, by 1873, they have already moved back, though, to Jefferson County, and James Sanders is renting nine acres of land. Um, he does purchase his own land by 1885, and according to that Florida census, you have to listen to these stats here. 1885 Florida census, James Sanders tilled 35 acres. 20 acres was in cotton, producing seven bales. A bale of cotton is about 500 pounds. So 3,500 pounds of cotton is what he produced. He did 18 acres in corn, producing 150 bushels. yet. Um, the 1910 census, which we didn't include um, an image of, by that time, again, he owns his own home and it is mortgage free. Um, he's around 82 years old in that 1910 census. Now the other son um, that we've been able to identify that was definitely at Highland and was sold by Monroe was Garrett. Um, he would have been in his early teens. Um, by the time of the sale. And at Casa Bianca, he was the blacksmith. So you see, um, this is a, a bill of sale in 1860. Uh, if you remember Joseph White, his wife Ellen, uh, by 1860, she is selling parts of the plantation to her nephew. And so this is the bill of sale to the nephew that identifies Garrett as the blacksmith. Um, there is a letter written by then Garrett's next owner, so the nephew named, uh, named James Patton Anderson. And right on the eve of the Civil War, Anderson is writing that Garrett is owed about six to $700 for blacksmithing work that he's done in the county. Uh, of course, after emancipation, he moves along with his brother James and their sister Peachy uh, to nearby Taylor County. And again, uh, he's head back to um, Jefferson County around that 1873 mark. The last document we find him in is the 1885 Florida census. One of the most significant documents though we found with Garrett Sanders is this one. His voter registration from 1867. This was the very first um, election that African American men in Florida could participate. And down towards the bottom, uh, you'll see uh, his name right there, Garrett Sanders. We were also able to find other men from Casa Bianca who voted. Um, we found this in an 1876 Senate Commission book. Um, turns out the 1876 presidential election was a little contentious and there were cries of voter fraud I don't know where I've heard this one before. Um, <laughs> in Florida, yes. Um, but Jefferson County was one of those counties that was investigated by the Senate. And so they, um, you can find this on Google Books. They published um, the list of registered voters and went through the entire list. And these are all the men's names we found. These, um, these were all enslaved at Casa Bianca and they all voted in the 1876. Now, not all of them uh, belong, had belonged to Monroe. Um, primarily on here, if you see the McGuire um, and then the Sanders, those are the two uh, main families um, that belong to Monroe. So we have one kind of final story um, with the Sanders and this is with their grandson, Peyton Pleasant. Um, he was the grandson of Toby Betsy. You'll see him there at the very bottom of the list, identified as a grandchild. He's also in that 1844 deed. And even though in that deed, 
Um, families are not um, specifically designated the way they are in the later 1855 list. Knowing the family designations in 1855, you can see the family designations in that 1844 deed. And this is where it's really curious because in 1844, Peyton was around two years old. And right above him is the name Lucy. Do you recall the antelope captives? It said wild sense, about 30 of them to Casabianca. Of those 30 individuals, all but one were men. The one woman's name, any guesses? It was Lucy. Um, so there is the possibility that Peyton, not just being the grandson of Toby and Betsy, but also the son and descendant of one of the antelope captives. Um, now, when in 1860, when Ellen White sells a portion of Casa Bianca to her nephew, James Patton Anderson, Peyton is one of those who is sold. Uh, if you remember the deed listing Garrett, Peyton's name is also in there. Now, his newest owner, um, James Patton Anderson, with the outbreak of the Civil War, before he had been in the US Army, in fact, he had served during the Mexican-American War, Guess which side he goes on in 1861? The Confederacy. Um, he eventually rises to the rank of Brigadier General um, for the Confederacy. Of course, officers uh, in the military generally took their enslaved personal servants with them. And Anderson took Peyton with him. Um, kind of implies that Peyton may have already been serving as Anderson's enslaved personal servant in the first place. Usually took along someone who you already knew, someone um, who you trusted. And so Peyton goes off to war with his, uh, his owner, with James Patton Anderson. But then halfway through, we find this letter in which Anderson writes, I find that our mess will have to rely upon Peyton as a permanent cook, and I must have a boy to wait on me. So around 1863, Instead of serving then as personal as enslaved personal servant to Anderson, he's now the cook, the mess cook um, for um, Anderson's group. Now that letter in which Peyton was said to then be the, the permanent cook, that was written at Missionary Ridge in Tennessee in 1863. And these are just stars showing, uh, you can see where you know, right outside of Tallahassee, about where Casa Bianca is, and then the upper red star, where Missionary Ridge is. You can see how far from home Peyton really is. And this is an artist's rendering of the battle that's there at Missionary Ridge, what Peyton um, would have experienced. Um, now, after emancipation, of course, the Freedmen's Bureau comes to Monticello, and they are in charge of the labor contracts with the former plantations. And this is Peyton Pleasant's mark up at the top where he's signing uh, a labor contract to work at Casa Bianca. And then the very bottom, this is where he's paid. He was actually paid $9.38 to work at Casa Bianca. Um, he married Mary Lawton in um, 1867. They did have four children. And we also find him in the 1885 Florida census uh, there on the bottom. We suspect, though, that Peyton died sometime after this 1885 census. We don't find him in any other records. Um, another record that we do find is an 1892 deed in which his widow is purchasing property in Monticello. So this next image um, we found in the Library of Congress. If you just do a search for Monticello, Florida, this is one that comes up. And it's entitled Selling a Freedman um, to Pay His Fine at Monticello, Florida. And for us, this is first a reminder that not all of the families were as successful as the ones we've highlighted this evening. Um, one man, now he was not owned um, by James Monroe, but he was there at the Casa Bianca Plantation. Uh, his name was Alfred Williams. Um, Sometime in 1866, 1867, he is arrested for petty larceny. But because of that arrest and that conviction, he loses his right to vote. And that, that 1876 um, Senate Commission book, that's where we found his court case. 
Um, we still haven't found details about the court case yet. Um, when I contacted the courthouse, they didn't know much about it. So I think it's another trip to Florida to go look through archives again to try and find details about Alfred Williams' case. But a few years later, he is one of those trustees for the Casa Bianca Missionary Baptist Church. Um, and then, of course, this is also a reminder, there are still some families that we have not found at all. Um, one of Toby and Betsy's children, one of their sons was named Augustus, and he had his wife Iris and their children. We cannot find them at all in any census record. So this image is kind of a reminder um, of true what we have found so far, but also how much more um, there is still to find. And then this is Toby and Betsy and the family members that we have been able to identify so far. Now with this, James Monroe wrote you know, many of these letters that he wants these, um, these individuals to be kept in families. You know, and Colonel White's going to take them in families. He hopes they are kept together in families. And it is very easy for us to look at that letter and say, well, they, they stayed in families, and to, to kind of dismiss it. But no, families, they were split apart. Um, and even though we've, we've looked at these families and gotten their descendants, what about going the opposite direction? You know, Eve and Dudley, what are their origins? You know, when they were sold, what siblings were they sold away from? What about their parents, perhaps their grandparents? Same question with Toby and Betsy. Now with Betsy, though, there's some information that makes us suspect her origins. So Casabianca documents, they put Betsy's birth around the early 1790s. In 1794, Monroe purchased from Jefferson Thenia Hemings and her five daughters. Of course, Thenia was an older sister of Sally Hemings. Now, one of Thenia's five daughters that Monroe purchased, her name was Betsy. Of course, the Hemings family, they also tend to honor family members with the same name in each generation. Betsy, the one in Florida, of course, you remember what was one of her son's names? James Sanders, James. James Hemings, of course, another brother of Thenia Hemings, was also the French cook for Jefferson. And then Betsy in Florida names a daughter Sally. So granted, these two, shall we say, they're coincidences. But what it makes us do is look at this and say there is a possibility for further exploration. So we, shall we say, hypothesize? Is that the best way to put it? A very conditional phrase um, that there is the possibility that Betsy is the daughter of Thenia Hemings. Um, th there's only one way to prove this, though, and that is with DNA testing. And I think you can see why then it then becomes so important to find these descendants. Um, this is again, the Sanders tree. Um, so these are the descendants that we need to locate, need to contact, see if they'd be interested in, in this type of work um, to find out for certain, is that really Betsy's origin? So I'm gonna throw that out there. There is a possibility um, that needs exploration. So what are we doing with all this? You've seen um, the Dudley and Eve tree and the Betsy and Toby tree, and we have many more names than that in the database. Um, the whole premise was that we make these um, findings accessible to, to people to whom it affects and researchers. And to do that, we published a website in August of 80, um, <laughs> in August of uh, 2017. I'm 18. sorry, 18. And it's takethemandfamilies.com after the letter from Monroe to Madison where he says, I've sold them to Colonel White of Florida who will take them and families to that territory. And if you've seen, that's really, that 
It's a very ambiguous comment. It has two very different readings. Well, the website, the website has a genealogical database is sort of its core. It's interactive. You can query it. It's not something that just delivers static pages, which means we can update it as we find new information. The family trees that you just saw uh, were generated by the website on the fly, and this is the kind of information you get from it. You can do, do a surname search. Uh, I think we're up to about 34 surnames and close to 200 names in the database. Um, if you zero in on one, you can then find information about persons. You can develop another kind of family tree. This one's really useful. Remember I said the, 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 the tree that we have uh, of Ned and Peggy goes from wall to wall? Well, you can compress all that in a fan chart and get every bit of the tree on one screen. You can't read any of it, but it's pretty. <laughs> Well, <laughs> and it's sort of useful. So what are we going to do to this? What do you think Miranda says at this point? Get in the car, right? <laughs> so off we go. This is September of last year. We're off to Florida, and here we are uh, just crossing the state line. We thought we'd stop in Tallahassee uh, and take some tourist pictures <laughs> at the beginning of what Tallahassee looks like today. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we're off to the Casa Bianca Church the morning after we arrived there. That's, that's going to be our first stop. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, when you see, um, you found the, the cornerstone that they placed here. And when you realize some of the names on it are the ones that are in your database, <laughs> that's pretty fun. Um, let's see, if you look kind of halfway down, one says Willie Nelson Chairman. Now, that is not like singer Willie Nelson at all. <laughs> Um, but that is another descendant on the McGuire side um, that we didn't highlight today. Um, and then towards, you also see, let's see Nathaniel Williams and then George Williams. And I mentioned to you um, the story of Alfred Williams very briefly. And those are his descendants there. So we thought we'd do some bushwhacking and see if we could find the site of the plantation house which burned in 1903. Um, we didn't really have any expectations other than we probably wouldn't find it. But the only thing left of Casa Bianca Plantation in terms of a place name is Casa Bianca Ridge Road, a little dirt road that starts right across the highway, almost exactly across the highway from the church. So that's the first stop, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go up Casa Bianca Ridge Road. And what happens when we do? <laughs> we see this live oak with a plaque in front of it. And this is not anything we expected to see. The developer in 1990, evidently, I guess to add tone or something to the area, put up this bronze plaque commemorating the plantation. It's got some misinformation on it, but you can imagine how excited we were when we found it. And it gives the location, I think it says 238 yards up the road is the, is the uh, site of the old plantation house. So now we have been, we haven't wallowed around in ashes or anything like that, but we have been to the site of the old plantation house. And that became a very valuable visit later that <laughs> evening. You want to talk some more about these things? Well, of course, <laughs> later in the day, um, we have to go do research. I went to the, the county courthouse. I don't know, do you oh. want to tell the story? Oh, I got to, okay. yeah, I got to tell a story on her. All right, she's a reference librarian, right? So we go into, and she's been in communication by telephone with the county courthouse before. She knows one of the clerks there by speaking to her. So she goes in, introduces herself, and says, and by the way, I'd like this document and that document. And the, the clerk looks at her and says, well, there's the room. They're, they're the archives. And she's frozen. <laughs> she's used to going into a place like the small collection at UVA where you put on the white gloves and you're very quiet. And here it is. There's an open door. I almost had to drag her through the open door to get her to get in there and start doing some work. But anyway, here she is yeah. doing what turned out to be some pretty productive work during the day. Then yeah. in the evening, we had our presentation. It was a small one, but it was pretty intense. Um, this is a, a group of people composed mostly of members of the Casa Bianca Church. We had sent some information down there about it. And it was, for us, it, it was perfect because it was a small enough, concentrated enough group to really have conversations with, which we did. After the presentation that we did like this, we, we then could really sit down with them and talk. Um, and, and, 
one of the most interesting parts of the talk was a question we got. Um, um, very shy. One question person. was, um, where was Costa Bianca Plantation? <laughs> where was the house? Yeah, where was and it? We had just been there just that morning. Just been there that morning. And it was right across the road from the church she goes to. And you can imagine why they hadn't gone up that road with that name. One of the things that happened, uh, and th this, is, this is, I just thought of this, one of the things that happened at Howland was we had a Descendants Day in March where we invited the, the folks that we had met at Middle Oak and others to come up and see what we did. And it was a full day. And sometime during the afternoon, somebody said, well, how many times have you visited Howland before? One of the researchers. Anybody want to guess? None. And they live right down the road. I think all of us can understand why that would not be a place you definitely wanted to visit. And they talked about their reactions, what they felt like when they did set foot on Highland property. That was a pretty amazing hour, I can tell you. So this was, this, this was really pretty much on that level. Mm -hmm. So what next? Well, I think it's probably pretty easy to guess. Every August, every August, the Middle Oak Baptist Church has a family homecoming. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? We would like, we would really like that to happen. That's the goal of the exercise when you get down to the human part of it, right? And on December the 5th last year, I had a telephone conversation with an 80-year-old man in Titusville, Florida, who is a descendant of Dudley and Eve. So it's getting more and more likely that we could actually do this. Thank you. <laughs>
um, stuck? Well, I, th I think the, probably the, the most bare bones answer is that an employee expects to be paid. And even though there was a cash economy on some plantations, uh, for example, Jefferson bought chickens, things like that, even though that was the case, there's still no balance between that and the unpaid effort, if you know what I mean. Um, a, a slave is forced to go out in the field. An enslaved person doesn't get to say when they come in to dinner, ex except in some circumstances. There are exceptions to all these things. So I think, yes, you, you can certainly look at that, I, I guess you could say economic relationship between the slaveholder and the employee, if you will. But it's, it, 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 that's a fairly special filter to apply. I think, you know, you're, you're saying, okay, I'm going to look at this aspect of that relationship. Um, but I think it's dangerous to do that because you really have to look at the entire framework of the relationship. Um, it, tools like that can be useful, but you got to always use them knowing that it's a restricted thing. I think it'd also be accurate to point out, too, that especially in situations where there was a larger enslaved population and, and an extensive uh, plantation or farm, you would have certain people in the population who would evolve or be taught specific skills. You'd mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. certain people who were general laborers, then you have others who would be cultivated to become blacksmiths, cobblers, servants in the household, and they still all have that same status. They still have the same lack of options, but they have, for mm -hmm. interests that serve the, the families uh, uh, for whom they're, they're, they're enslaved, that they're, they're developing those skills to uh, support that household or their business. And they sometimes derive real income from it, too. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that, that's really well documented, especially in the case of blacksmiths, valuable men. So I know on some of the family trees there were like as many as 10 children, and I know that when my dad did his genealogy, it was not uncommon to see a fair number of either women dying in childbirth mm -hmm. or um, children dying very young, you know, less than one year old. Was that something you guys found too? Oh, yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, some of the children for the families, you'll see them, for example, the 1870 census and then the 1880 census, they're completely gone. You can't find a marriage record for them, and you can only assume um, they most likely did not survive um, those next 10 years. Um, and then in terms of you know, seeing that many children, I know there are a few of the families in which the wife dies and the husband remarries, and there's a second, um, so a half sibling going on with some of the families. The first thing is a lot of people that came from Africa actually did come with the skills, blacksmithing. Absolutely. You know, there's a big uh, history of that, especially in Mali, with the Toregs mm -hmm. and um, a mm -hmm. lot of the cu culture. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, you know, us usually we're talking about transport in terms of um, water. So when they come from Savannah right. and go to um, Florida, right. what is the transporter in there? Is there any kind of documentation of the transport that might add something. Ex excellent question. It's, it's a surmise on our part that land route was likely, that's 200 miles, um, much shorter than some of the copper routes from say Northern Virginia South. So, and Wild was a cheapskate just like his partner in, in some ways. So that makes me lean towards it, but the ones that Monroe sold, my guess there is it's Norfolk around Florida, up to Pensacola or New Orleans and then back. Um, but that, that, that I would, I'd give 90% water route to that one. But I'd say, I'll go 50-50 on the land route with, with Wild's group. And of course, then we have water route, you know, from New Orleans to Pensacola, much shorter route. Um, and that's still on the water because that part of the country is just too wild to, to try to transport on land. 
And we have a lot of other questions about just that problem. What about Kentucky? Some came down from Kentucky, probably down the river to New Orleans. Um, there, there, there are a lot of things. One of our goals, I should say, um, uh, expressly, is there were 121 names on that 1855-1856 inventory. We want to find where all of them came from. We're about halfway there. But we really, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the upper bound of the project, if you will. We, we, we would like to know the whole story for that plantation. Because every one informs another part. I mean, your, your point about, yeah, they came over here already knowing how to be blacksmiths is, is excellent. You know, that's, that's, that's the, the kind of thing you find. There's a question I had. I'll go ahead and slip it in here. You, you encountered the people, certainly down the road in Albemarle County, that had a family tradition, an oral tradition of the Monroe Association. And, and uh, just to clarify, especially since we're bringing in the Hemings connection, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the Monroe surname adopted is not on the basis of them believing that they are descended from the Monroe family, but rather the, the enslaved status that they have under Monroe, correct? This or or are there? This is one of my favorite questions because it's a tough one. There are two general patterns. One is that people who are descended from or immediately after emancipation assume the surname of the holder of the plantation, the owner of the plantation, and then the exact opposite case where any name other than that one. You don't find many Jeffersons in Albemarle County. They watched their families being broken up on the auction block in Charlottesville. Monroe's, how did that happen? They all seem to descend from one couple, Ned and Peggy. And Ned and Peggy escaped the move to Florida, the sale to Florida. Did they have some special place? That's my guess. And therefore, they had a different attitude about the plantation. But I want to, okay, that, that's a theory I've been pound, telling people for years and years. Then I thought about three months ago, I thought, well, you know, there's got to be some, there's got to be some scholarship on this topic, right? There isn't any. Not that I could find. There is scholarship on the mutation of African given names and surnames when they come to the state, some for, some not. There is scholarship on um, a lot of things to do with names other than why did they assume the name, the surname they assumed. It's mostly on given names, but I couldn't find a thing. Anybody looking for a dissertation? <laughs> really? <laughs> this would be a good one. That, that's something that really needs some research. I'd love to know this. The real answer to it. The, the other part of that I wondered was, jumping then to the Florida side of the equation, some people weren't even aware where Casa Bianca was. They may or may not have understood their relationship to the plantation been there. Was there any evidence any of those folks knew anything of the Monroe connection? This is one of the first questions, <laughs> almost the first question I asked the people at Middle Oak Baptist Church. What do you know about Florida? Florida? It's hot down there. They'd heard nothing. They had no, they had no history they know of. If we collect enough oral histories, you're going to find fragments of, of a history that includes that. And the same was true of Florida. We found nobody down there who had any inkling of Virginia roots. But we'll find that too. I, I just give odds on that because these things are preserved. Um, you know, this is important. And it may be mutated in a way that's very difficult to recognize when you car when you car correlate a lot of stories, then, then you can see these things. And one of the things I also asked the Middle Lake Baptist Church was, why'd you take the name Monroe? Well, who owned the plantation? Pure and simple. That was the answer. So I'm, I think the more I look at it, the more confused I get, really. Good question. Well, thank you all again so much. We appreciate it. And um, we wish you luck as this journey <laughs> continues. And uh, I'm sure you'll get in the car a number of more times. <laughs> and thank we thank you, thank you all for coming out this evening. We have some refreshments in the hallway. We'd be delighted for you to enjoy and hope to see you at our other programs at the James Monroe Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.